Okay, ladies, let's uh let's finish the new system today, okay? All right, we'll wrap this up today. Um, keep this as brief as possible. Okay. We left off talking about how the third line of defense works. So can I'm gonna pick on. We may. We may explain how the third line works in your own words. What has to happen? Yep. So the T cells and the B cells have to see the invader. How are the helper T cells seeing the invader? What is presenting? Yep, they're seeing the antigen. Very good. So the way it works is uh, something has to swallow the invader and present it. And that's what you're seeing here. Okay, So you're seeing basically the uh, presentation of the antigen. So the bacterium has different antigens on the surface. So in this case, you see rectangles and triangles being displayed. And you have the B cells that are also recognizing the antigens. Along comes what? Helper T cell recognizes the antigen being presented. You can see this communication between the two cells. The helper T cell then starts to uh, divide and then communicates with another cell, the B cell. But here's the thing. This is what we talked about today. There are, because the B cells are slightly different, each B cell has a slightly different receptor. So you have like like B cells, but there's like millions of different versions of B cells. Some will have receptors that will bind these triangles, some will have receptors that will bind the rectangles and so on and so forth. So what happens is the, the B cells that have the right receptor for the antigen, they're the ones that get picked. And they're the ones that start to divide. So that's why it's specific line of defense, because you're not just taking any B cell or any helper T cell. It's the one that has the matching receptor. Now, we talked about what an antibody is. So an antibody is uh, a protein that starts off at the surface of a B cell, and then later on it's just released. Okay? Once that B cell is picked, because it has the matching receptor, it starts pumping out these antibodies, and these antibodies will be able to attach to the antigens. Now, and what you're seeing here, by the way, is that interaction. So here is the part of the antibody. So if you were to zoom into this area, and you can see this is the antigen that would fit in. So this is like the lock, and this... So this is like the key, and this is the uh, keyhole. The thing about the anti antibodies is that you don't have to have like a perfect fit. It just has to fit somewhere. So it's not like a locking key because then you start thinking, okay, um, you know how like you've had this experience, I'm sure you've had this experience before where you put a key in a lock and it fits, but it doesn't work. It's not the right key. So it's not like this. All you need is the key to fit in the lock. You don't have to turn the lock. You just have to fit into it. So in this picture here, what are you noticing? It doesn't have to be one specific antibody. You could have uh, different antibodies attached to the antigen because as long as an antibody can recognize just part of the antigen, it will be able to stick to it. Okay. So don't assume that an antigen, I know we draw them as like little uh, triangles or rectangles or circles, but an antigen is a very complicated molecule because it's a, it's a protein, right? And a protein is, you saw what proteins look like. They're three-dimensional, they're very complicated. So as long as the antibody can fit anywhere on the antigen, it will work. Okay, it will work. Um, now the question that we're going to talk about today is, well, okay, how do we 
pick that B cell? And why are there so many different B cells? So in this slide, what you're seeing is something called clonal selection. Okay, clonal selection. So let's break that term down. Clonal selection. What's a clone? It's a copy, okay? So in this case, what did we copy? Which one, though? Which B cell was copied? This one. Why? Why that one? Because that receptor matches that antigen. Now, is it possible that a, a, another B cell will be picked too? Yeah, because as you saw in this slide here, the, there could be more than one possibility that fits the antigen. So yeah, it's, it, it's possible that you could get another B cell that also fits. All right. Here's the question though. What is this on the surface? What is this? It's a protein, right? Where do proteins come from? From your DNA, genes, right? And we talked about that, right? So if you have only, how many genes do we have? 20,000 about, 21,000, around there? Okay. Here's the, here's the question we're going to answer that. These are proteins. They sit on the surface of a B cell, or helper T cell, or a cytotoxic T cell, okay? And there are millions of slightly different versions of them. So how do you get so many different versions of proteins when you don't have that many genes? Okay, so you, you'll be saying, well, isn't that splicing, sir? Isn't that what we talk? In this case, it's actually not splicing. So if I would ask you that question last semester, you would say it's splicing. Remember what that is? That's when the RNA gets cut up into and, and then the, uh, gets rearranged. That's not what's happening here. Something different is happening here, okay? What's happening here, it kind of looks like splicing, but it's not splicing, okay? It's called genomic rearrangement. So it's this thing right here. So what happens in genomic rearrangement is something really interesting. When you started off as a human being, how many cells were you? Do you recall? Well, you wouldn't recall because you, you didn't have a brain at that point, but you were one cell, and that one cell copied itself, right? Into trillions of cells. When cells copy themselves, the DNA is exactly what? The same, except for any what? Mutation. Okay, we talked about mutation semester one. And this is true. So in your lab that you guys are talking about the difference between liver, kidney, and muscle, the genetics of every cell is the same. Right? And you have to answer the question, well, if the genetics are the same, how are they producing different proteins? And that has to do with uh, cell specialization. When cells mature, what they do is they turn on genes and they turn off other genes. So even though they all have the same genes, they're not using all the same combinations. So every cell has the exact same DNA, except here. So as a B or T cell matures, what it does is it actually alters its DNA. It rearranges it, okay? So take a look at this slide. What you're seeing here is DNA, and you see that there are segments of DNA. And as this cell matures, what it does, in this case, is you can actually see it's cut out some of its DNA. So you can take a look. You see here, like for example, this green section is missing. This little red section is missing. What happens then is as the DNA gets cut and pasted back together, but it gets cut and pasted differently, Kind of reminds me of splicing, but we're not altering the RNA, we're altering the DNA here. Okay? So it's similar, but it's not the same. So what that means then is every B cell, every T, every T cell will have slightly different, uh, 
DNA when it comes to the section that makes, guess what? Which protein? The antibodies. Or the receptors. Okay? So because they're actually, as they mature, they rearrange their DNA, they're slightly different. And that slight difference allows them to make millions of different types of receptors and antibodies. So it should theoretically be possible that you can get any antigen and you should be able to find a match for it because you have all of these different types of receptors. And the receptors don't have to perfectly fit, they just have to partially fit. So you should be able to find something for any invader. Once you find that matching receptor, then what happens is that cell is copied. So that's where the clonal selection comes in. So you're selecting the right cell with the right receptor, and then that cell is stimulated and divides, and then you have an army of them. So yesterday I was giving you the analogy of like all of these occasions that you have to go to, like funerals, weddings, everything needs everything needs a, a different dress. So think of every cell here as like a different dress, right? You have to be able to pick the right one for the right location. So the receptors, the diversity of the receptor and antibodies comes to the genomic rearrangement, the rearranging of genomes. So I, I give the kids this kind of analogy, right? Imagine that these segments are kind of like ingredients in an ice cream store, okay? Imagine the V stands for ice cream flavors, the J stands for ice cream cones, and the uh, the rest of it maybe are the topics. So every store starts, starts off with the exact same ingredients, right? But maybe we may like vanilla and chocolate on a waffle cone with sprinkles. So even though the, everyone starts off with the exact same DNA or same ingredients, when she matures, she prefers vanilla, chocolate, waffle cone with sprinkles. Maybe Charlu likes lemon ice cream. I don't know if you like lemon ice cream. With a sugar cone with maybe a uh, coconut shaving on top. So we all start off the same, but as they mature, they, so they all start off with the same ingredients, but as they mature, they become slightly different. Now there are two other things that happen when the, uh, when this genome is rearranged and and cut and pasted back together. There are some insertions and deletions that happen. So when the the DNA is cut and put back together, we have insertions and deletions. Now you guys remember what that is, right? Insertions and deletions. That's when we add DNA and insertions, or when we take away. DNA insertions, uh, sorry, deletions. And then the other thing that happens is you have hypermutation. Now, this means that uh, if you were to measure the mutation rate in that area that's responsible for making the receptors and antibodies, the rate is 10,000 times higher than normal. So if you think about what's going on then, all these three things generate variety. The insertion deletions, the point mutations, the rearranging of the genome, they all generate all of this variety because the name of the game is to have as many possible receptors as possible because you don't know what you're going to get. You have no idea what's going to affect your body. So you need to have all of these things in your third line of defense because you have no idea. It's kind of like you don't know what occasion you're going to go to. If you only have one dress sitting in that closet, and it happens to be a uh, bright pink dress, and then all of a sudden a funeral, you got to go to a funeral, you're going to go to a funeral with a bright pink dress? You're in huge trouble, okay? So the whole point is to have as much variety as possible. Okay, so that's how we get all of this uh, variety in the third line of, uh, of defense. Do you have any questions about, about the third line then? All right. We talked about the third line takes time to learn. Okay. So uh, it, it's been discovered that it takes about maybe a year or two 
to learn because we just talked about how it works, right? The third line hunts down things that are what? Things that are, what does the third line look for? What does it look for? How does it know what to attack? So you just saw how it works, right? How does the third line work? If the B cells and T cells combine to it, what happens? They're going to attack it, right? So they, they learn over time what they can attack and what they can't attack. So there's a process called uh, clonal deletion. Okay, and you can see from this slide that's not very well understood. But the idea goes something like this. If those cells combine to your own cells, they have to be eliminated. Why? They're going to destroy you. So this is going on in the first little, you know, first part of your life. Okay, in the first year or two, these cells are being eliminated because otherwise, if you let them get through, these cells will eventually will attack your own cells, and that's what so we don't want that to happen. Okay, it does happen because we know that well, we're going to talk about this that there are Lots of diseases where your immune system accidentally attacks its own cells. So this is the normal idea where cells that can attack your own get terminated, they get deleted, eliminated. But we know that this process is not 100%. Because we know sometimes they get through. Uh, okay, so let's look at then some examples of autoimmunity. Okay where this process fails, where these cells that are supposed to uh, be eliminated, you know, end up coming back to attack you. So here are some examples. There's lupus. Uh, we have arthritis. We have type 1 diabetes, not to be confused with type 2 diabetes. And uh, multiple sclerosis. That was the one we looked at with the animation where your white blood cells attack your myelin sheath, which is the coating around certain neurons. Okay. And then type 1 diabetes is when your, uh, your immune system attacks the uh, beta cells. So you don't make uh, insulin. So what happens then in this case, you can see that uh, these cells are they made a mistake. They're, they're, they think that your cells are are foreign, so they they combine to them, and they're like, oh well, we can bind to this cell. That means it must be foreign, so we must get rid of it and attack it. Uh, but sometimes it's not just a problem with autoimmunity. So autoimmunity is when the cells attack your own. Sometimes it's the problem is. The immune system just overreacts. Did you know, do you know anyone who overreacts? You know anyone who overreacts to anything? Yeah, lots of people, right? I know lots of people who overreact. So the problem is, uh, sometimes your immune system just overreacts. Okay? So an allergic reaction would be an example of this, where you get things like constricted airways that could inhibit breathing. So the idea behind an allergic reaction is very similar to what you just saw in how the third line works. You have to be exposed to an allergen. Okay. Now, what sits on the surface of the allergen are, would be the antigen. Okay. Will be that marker on the outside that protein that's going to stimulate the third line. Now you saw that the, if your third line can bind to it, it will start producing what? Antibodies. Okay, it will start producing antibodies. And the antibodies are also receptors. The receptor on the B cell and T cell, well, the, the receptor on the B cell ends up becoming the antibodies. So if you take a look at this, receptor, which is now an antibody, you'll notice that it has a perfect fit for the antigen on this pollen grain. Now, do you know what pollen is? Pollen is the stuff that uh, certain plants throw up in the air. 
it's basically plant sperm. And at certain times of the year, people get like, uh, you have like runny nose or itchy eyes and maybe you cough because you're inhaling all of this stuff. Okay. So if you have an allergic reaction, your third line has recognized it. Your third line is making antibodies. The problem is some of those antibodies then become receptors for what are called mast cells. Okay? Where have you heard mast cells before? They're the ones that release what? What do they release? Just an H. And it seems like all medical problems start with the word his. His. Even female problems. Like hysterectomy. Why does it have to start with a his? Why can't it be her hysterectomy? Why can it be hysterectomy? Anyways. Right? All the problems, right? Charlie? All problems start with the word his. It's a male thing. So, histamine is released by mast cell. Now, what happens then is these mast cells now have these receptors for the antigen. So guess what happens when they interact with the antigen? They get, they overreact. They're triggered. So then they release all of this histamine. And the thing about histamine, the histamine causes symptoms like the runny nose, the um, buildup of mucus, but it also will generate uh, this big problem, potentially, where the airways will start getting constricted. So if you ever had, if you ever know someone who has an anaphylactic, anaphylactic reaction to something, or anaphylaxis, that is an overreaction of your immune system. You're producing all of this histamine. The histamine causes swelling. Problem is if the swelling is in the airway, that means the amount of space for air to get through is less. What could you give that person to open up their airway? Yeah, adrenaline. Because you saw in the stress response that epinephrine opens up your airway, increases breathing, right? So this is your immune system just over overreacting. Adrenaline. Yeah, epinephrine. Sorry? Intolerance is like a lactose intolerance? Yeah, that's a good question. So lacto that's more of like a digestive issue. Right? Like if you're like intolerant or something, you probably you eat it and it causes like some pretty nasty symptoms like bloating, farting, diarrhea. But that's that's a digestive issue, right? Yeah. To crab? That's not then I wouldn't be intolerant. I would say I would say that's probably an allergic reaction. And that goes back to my whole thing at the beginning about the immune system. So you're saying your aunt had uh, reactions to crab and then automatically, sorry, just magically disappeared. Whereas my aunt had the exact opposite. She had no reaction to walnuts and then in the 60s developed a reaction. The immune system is, is for me, um, like I, on the one hand I understand it, but on the other hand it's very mysterious. There's a lot of randomness that goes into the immune system. So stuff like what you're saying is just more examples of like the immune system is a little bit, a little bit hard to figure out. That, you know, you could develop allergies later on in life and you could lose them. Yeah. So there's a, so hey, if you want to get into immunology, maybe go ahead and figure out why stuff like that happens. Show you another example of where your immune system, uh, you know, will maybe do something that you don't want it to do. So pregnancy. We actually talked about this, right? We talked about the, uh, on the blood types. There's A, there's the B, and O blood types. There's also there's a positive and negative, the rhesus factor. Now, so if you have to explain to me why is it that if you have Rh negative blood, you're, and you're, so imagine that you're an Rh positive person and you receive negative blood. Why can't your immune system attack it? Yeah, there's nothing there to attack. If you understand the third line, how does the third line work? Your cells have to bind to the antigen, right? What if there's no antigen? Nothing to attack. 
So with the recess factor, the way it works, oh, someone's door, hold on, let's pause this. Okay, so, uh, recess factor. So if you are an RH positive, you're welcome, RH positive person, right? Let's say you're female, you're pregnant, RH positive, and your baby's RH negative, that's fine. What if it's the other way around? What if you're RH negative and the baby's RH positive? So RH positive means that on the surface of the red blood cell, there is an antigen. Now, if you're RH negative, what does your immune system learn over time? That that antigen shouldn't be there, right? It has learned that the absence of the antigen is normal. So what happens when it encounters the antigen? It will launch an attack, right? Now, if you're RH negative mother and you have an RH positive baby, the first pregnancy is okay because your immune system has to learn that the RH positive baby is a problem. It has to build an immune response to it. By the time your, your immune system builds a response to the uh, RH positive blood, the baby's already gone. Like it's, it's already born, right? So it's out of the body. It's fine. But you saw that uh, anytime your immune system sees something the second time, it be, the response is what? More dramatic, but also quicker. So if you're a, um, a, a RH negative mother and it's your second pregnancy and the baby's RH positive again, then without medical treatment, that baby could be in big trouble. Because you're, you're going to generate antibodies, and those antibodies are going to basically... They're going to get, because they can cross the placenta, and they can get into the bloodstream, and they basically attack the baby. And what these uh, antibodies will do is they will cause something called hemolysis. Lysis means to break apart. So they will literally break apart the red blood cells. So your the fetus could starve of oxygen. That could go, that could be really bad. That could go from fatal to, uh, you know, mental deficiency, so my sister-in-law, when she was giving birth to her, her second child, um, guess what the doctor forgot to give her? There's a needle that you could take to prevent this from happening. There's a medication that you can take that if you're an RH negative mother and you've had an RH positive baby, you can take this to prevent this from happening. You know what her doctor did? She forgot to give her the needle. Can you imagine that? So they were freaking out. My, my brother and my sister were freaking out. They were like, they were told like horror stories. Like basically, you know, your, your your daughter might have all of these issues. And um, I I always always under the impression when I came across the, this scenario about the RH negative mother with RH positive baby, I was always an impression that baby was always going to suffer some way. But I don't know what happened, but my niece is perfectly fine. So she has no issues whatsoever. So she's very, very lucky. But that's the point. She's very lucky. Maybe because her last name is Barry. Um, very, very lucky. So this is where you're, you know, you don't want your immune system to be launching an attack. That that could be really, really bad. Uh, I just want to wrap up with um, we've been talking about pathogens, right, and disease-causing organisms. But you saw it does not have to be a disease-causing organism for your immune system to react to it. Like a pollen grain is not a disease-causing organism. Uh, a fetus is not a disease-causing organism. So even though we've been focusing on pathogens, uh, it's not always pathogens that are the problem. I'll show you one last one. And because we, you know, we focus on things like bacteria, virus, and parasites. Uh, but have you guys ever heard of uh, prions? We talked about prions, right? Do you remember what a prion is? A prion is a protein that does what? Alters the behavior of a normal protein. So if your prion interacts with a normal protein, 
and changes its behavior. And those proteins are important in the functioning of a neuron, then your neuron will start to fail. And if your neurons start to fail, your nervous system starts to fail. And then uh, you will see symptoms. So mad cow disease, it was called mad cow disease because when these were looking at these animals, these cows that had this infection of prions, they, they, the, the cows were behaving really weird. It's not because they were mad or crazy. It's because they were infected with these prions that were uh, affecting the nervous system. So it's not all about bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Uh, there are other things that your immune system will have to deal with. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this picture is because, uh, actually, do you know what's going on? What do you think this is a picture of? This, this child looks does not look well, right? What's wrong with this child? Looks like the child's wasting away, right? You can see very little muscle left, you know. This child has something called Kuru. So this is uh, similar to mad cow. It's caused by a protein called by caused by prion, and um, I don't know if this still happens today. I would imagine it probably does. But what what you're seeing in this picture is a result of cannibalism. So this is in Papua New Guinea, and again, I don't know if this still occurs, but what, what used to happen traditionally is when people would die, sometimes some cultures would consume the person, they would eat them, because they think that they're getting something from that person. So coral was seen in women and, and children, but not in men, and it has nothing to do with men having a better immune system. Supposedly what goes on is when someone dies, if they have the prions in their body and they're infected, the males eat first and they go after the uh, body parts that are supposedly more tasty, which no idea what that would be, right? And those body parts do not have the prions. They go after like the muscle, for example, right? But And the women and children get the leftover parts. Left, le the leftover parts include the organ meats, where you find the prions. So you, in other words, men are very unlikely to get this disease. Women and children are more likely to get it. So this is a picture of a, of a boy who has Kuru. So he's infected with this prion. Now I say that I don't know if this happens today, but listen, you got, uh, seven billion people on this planet and there are some pretty weird people out there. Uh, I don't know guys, I don't know if you know the story of the German cannibal. I, I, I'm not making this up, okay? You can Google it if you don't believe me. Uh, a few years ago I was reading this article about this German who put out an ad um, for he wanted to uh, interview people as potential candidates for someone to eat. Literally. He sent out this invite for to be eaten by him. You know he had people come to his house to be interviewed as potential meals for this guy. So there is it's really weird, but there are some people out there that they're they're they just I don't know how what they're thinking, but they have this obsession with actually being eaten by someone else. Isn't that weird? Charlie, you're like, oh my god, I can't you know, why are you talking to me about this, right? And the, so he, there's an actual the case. He, he actually ended up, um, picking somebody. Can you, and can you imagine that you're the one who didn't get picked? It, you know, like, like you'd be like, thank God you didn't get, he didn't get picked, right? But this one poor guy got picked and, uh, went over his house. They had dinner and he eventually killed the guy. I'm not going to describe it graphically, but put him in his freezer. He got caught. There's this whole case, uh, well, there was a case. He's been convicted. Um, so, like, I would like to say that cannibalism does not happen anymore on this planet, but I can't for sure tell you that it doesn't happen. Because there, again, seven billion people. There are some pretty weird, weird ones out there.
So uh, the only way you can get it is if you eat someone who is infected with it. Oh, the, the, the story with the German cannibal has no, nothing to do. Yeah. yeah. How did they get infected? They probably ate something else that had prions in it. So I, if you're asking me where did the prions start from, it's probably some animal. But then I don't know how. Like then it's like you know, how did the animal get it, right? So at some point, where did it start? And I have no idea where it started. Uh, a lot of these things that you know um, we try to figure out, like viral outbreaks, where they came from. It's actually not that easy. Was it? I'm trying to think, it was last year there was, there was an outbreak of a virus, and they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. I can't remember the actual name of the virus. They were trying to figure out where did this outbreak start, and they had a really Difficult time figuring it out. Can I can't remember the name of the uh, Ebola started off. That's the one. They couldn't figure out where the outbreak started. They had no idea. But Ebola is thought to originate probably in bats. I believe in bats. And so it has to originate somewhere in some animal in some location. Now we talked about uh, HIV already, so I don't need to talk about that. But have you guys in the news? Heard about the Zika virus? You, is, you guys have heard about that? It's a it's a big problem in Brazil right now. This is a virus that's transmitted by a mosquito, and it causes microcephaly. And so, if you're a pregnant mother and you get infected with this virus, your baby could be born with a really small brain. I didn't know this, but Brazil is investigating 7,500 cases of children with microcephaly. Can you imagine that? 7,500 cases. That would be 15 times the size of our school. 15 times the size of our school of kids being born with small brains. And this is in Brazil. And, and So here's the fear. Guess where the Olympics are? So what do you think the fear is now? You can have half a million people going to Brazil if they get infected, they could be spreading that virus everywhere, right? That's a big fear. So we're lucky here because guess what? We don't have. No, we have mosquitoes, but we don't have we don't have the we don't have the mosquito that transmits the Zika virus. And you know why we don't have it? Because it's too damn cold in Canada. <laughs> All right, ladies, we'll still end there, okay? Okay, we'll see you uh, tomorrow. Bye, girls.